Okay, so we're going to have a look at a really interesting random variable which is related to the Riemann zeta function there. So for the sake of this video, we're just looking at the Riemann zeta function as a function of real numbers rather than one of complex numbers. So we define this for s greater than 1 as the sum over all integers greater than or equal to 1 of 1 over k to the power of s. And that gives us the Riemann zeta function at s. And then we're going to use this to define a random variable x using its probability mass function. And here we're saying that x can take values, positive integers, greater than or equal to 1, and the probability that x is equal to n is 1 over n to the power of s multiplied by the Riemann zeta function at s. So the first thing we're going to do with this random variable x is just check that it is actually a well-defined random variable, check that this um, probability mass function is a, a proper probability mass function. And all I'm going to do to check that is make sure that all of these probabilities are non-negative and I'm also going to make sure that they all add up to 1. So to check that they're all non-negative, this is straightforward enough because n is always positive and then the Riemann zeta function at s, well s is positive, we're adding up lots of different positive things here. So the Riemann zeta function is positive, this is positive, we definitely get a positive probability for each n here. And then to check that all of the probabilities add up to 1 when you add these together, we'll just have a look at how do we do this. So you can do your sum from n greater than or equal to 1 of probability x equals n. And we know how to write this just from the definition of our probability mass function. So it's 1 over n to the power of s multiplied by zeta s. And then you can see here this zeta s doesn't actually depend on n, so we can take this outside of our sum. This is just a constant. We get 1 over zeta s to the sum of 1 over n to the power of s. Now, this sum, what is this? We've got an n instead of a k, but you can see here this sum, all this is, is the Riemann zeta function at s with a different letter in there. So all we've got here then is 1 over zeta of s multiplied by zeta of s, which of course gives us 1. So all the probabilities sum to 1, and that means that this is indeed a proper random variable. So now let's have a look at what we can do with our random variable. So the first thing I'm going to have a look at, just for an example, is what is the probability that x is even? So to be an even number, we know that this is, we're looking at the probability x equals 2, and we're adding this to the probability x equals 4, and so on. And we can write this much more concisely using a sum here. So we can write this as the sum k is greater than or equal to 1, the probability x is equal to 2k. So here, when k is 1, we get the probability x is 2. When k is 2, we get the probability x is 4. When k is 3, we get the probability x is 6, and so on. And then I can use our definition of the probability x takes a certain value using the Riemann zeta function here. What I'll get is the sum from k greater than or equal to 1. Now I've got 2k to the power of s. And still even z to function at s. Okay, so now you can see here we might be able to, once again we can take out the zeta of s, that's great. But we've also got a 2 to the power of s which doesn't depend on k, so I can take that outside of our sum as well. So what I'll get is 1 over 2 to the power of s, zeta of s, and then we've got, once again, the sum k greater than or equal to 1, 1 over k to the power of s. And then we know this sum, this is nice and familiar, this is just zeta of s. So we get 1 over 2s, zeta of s, multiplied by zeta of s. These two cancel, and we get 1 over 2 to the power of s. So this is interesting, the probability x is even is 1 over 2 to the power of s. 
And something else that we just get for free here is that the probability x is odd. This is 1 minus the probability x is even. So we know this is 1 minus 1 over 2 to the power of s. So next, let's have a look at, now that we've worked out the probability x is odd and x is even, what's the probability that x is a multiple of a certain number, p? Well, we know, just as we saw before, that this is the probability x is equal to p plus the probability x equals 2p plus the probability where x is 3p and so on. So this is the sum k greater than or equal to 1 probability x is equal to kp. And then we can also write this using the definition of sum k greater than or equal to 1, 1 over kp to the power of s multiplied by zeta of s. And just like we've seen in the previous example, we can take out the power of k, we can take out p to the power of s and we can take out zeta of s get 1 over p to the s, zeta of s, and then all we're left with here is 1 over k to the s, this sum, and we know by now that this is the real zeta function. These two will cancel, and we get 1 over p to the power of s. So the probability that x is a multiple of p is 1 over p to the power of s. So now let's have a look at a slightly more interesting problem. Let's have a look at what is the probability that x is a multiple of 3 and 5. So first thing I'm going to do to solve this is actually I can notice that x is a multiple of 3 and 5. All this means is that x is a multiple of 15. Well, that's because in order to be a multiple of both 3 and 5, you need to be in the 3 times table and you need to be in the 5 times table. The only numbers that are in both are in the 15 times table. So you're a multiple of 15. And then we know that this is equal to 1 over 15 to the power of s. But what's interesting about this example of 3 and 5 is that 3 times 5 gives you 15. So we can also write 1 over 15 to the power of s as 1 over 3 to the power of s multiplied by 1 over 5 to the power of s. And then what this means is we've got the product of actually the probability that x is a multiple of 3 and the probability that x is a multiple of 5. And the consequence of this is quite interesting, actually, because this means that x being a multiple of 3 and x being a multiple of 5 are independent of each other. So this is using the definition of two probabilities, um, two events being independent, that if the product of their probability is equal to the probability of both of them happening. So the probability that you're a multiple of 3 and a multiple of 5 is the probability you're a multiple of 3 times the probability you're a multiple of 5. So that means that being a multiple of 3 and being a multiple of 5 are independent of each other. So just using the shorthand, multiple of 3 is independent of multiple of 5. But this, this rule doesn't actually always work, so let's just have a look at What's the probability that x is a multiple of 2 and 4? Well, unfortunately this isn't the same as x being a multiple of 8. So in order to be a multiple of 2 and 4, all you need to be is a multiple of 4. Because if you're a multiple of 4, then that number is automatically a multiple of 2. So this is equal to, it's the probability that you're a multiple of 4, which is 1 over 4 to the power of s. And this is not equal to 1 over 2 to the power of s times 1 over 4 to the power of s. So being a multiple of 2 and being a multiple of 4 are not independent of each other. So what's interesting about 3 and 5 is actually the fact that 
when you multiply these two numbers together, you get the lowest common multiple. So 3 times 5 is equal to the lowest common multiple. That's 3 and 5. Whereas here, the lowest common multiple of 2 and 4 is equal to 4, but it's not equal to 2 times 4. So this trick doesn't seem to work unless these two numbers, their product is their lowest common multiple. And this happens whenever the two numbers don't have any common factors. So for example, if you look at 7 and 11, these have no common factors. If you multiply them together, you get 77, which is their lowest common multiple. But if you had 16 and 12, if you multiply these together, you get 192, but their lowest common multiple is much smaller than that, actually, it's 48. So the product is the lowest common multiple. This only happens when you don't have any factors in common. So this means that if x is a multiple of p, or if we're interested in x being a multiple of q, these two events are independent of each other when p and q don't have any common factors. And we're actually, we're also going to be interested in x not being a multiple of some numbers, x not being a multiple of q, x not being a multiple of p. And in fact, this thing here tells us that if x is not a multiple of p, if we're interested in this event, this is also independent of x not being a multiple of q. So if you have two completely unrelated events independent of each other, and you also look at kind of the opposite of each event, it makes sense that those two events will also be independent of each other. And actually, these are independent of each other, but we could also have, for example, what's the probability that x is not a multiple of p, q, or r for any three numbers which don't have any common factors. And we know that these three events are actually going to be independent of each other once again. And we can apply this actually to having any number. We haven't really shown that here. That's not so much the point. So you can say that this probability, the probability that you're not a multiple of any of these, is equal to the probability that you're not a multiple of p, multiplied by the probability you're not a multiple of q, multiplied by the probability you're not a multiple of r. And then we know the probability that you are a multiple of p is 1 over p to the power of s. So what this gives us is 1 minus 1 over p to the power of s. We multiply this by 1 minus 1 over q to the power of s. Divide by 1 minus 1 over r to the s. So now we're ready to build up to the big finale of this video, which is where we're going to calculate the following probability. We're going to calculate the probability that x is not a multiple of any number greater than or equal to 2. So we're not a multiple of 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. And the first thing I'm going to do towards calculating this probability is actually simplifying how I've written this. So we're interested in not being a multiple of any of these numbers. So if we're not a multiple of 2, we're automatically not going to be a multiple of 4. So we don't really need to specify that we're not a multiple of 4. So I can cross that out. And I can actually do the same with any even number here, can't I? So not being a multiple of 2, this already excludes all of these cases with the even numbers. And similarly here, we don't care about being a multiple of 9, because that's already ruled out, because x isn't a multiple of 3. And you may see some structure here. This looks a bit like the sieve of Eratosthenes, so more on that later. But 
what this means is the probability of a not a multiple of any of these numbers is the probability of not being a multiple of 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13. And then the next one left would be 17. It's actually all of your prime numbers are the only ones that we need to specify here. So this is the probability that x is not a multiple of any prime number. Now we know that this probability, if we're interested in not being a multiple of 2, not being a multiple of 3, not being a multiple of 5, we know that all of these are actually independent of each other as pairs. And this does actually extend to having more than just 2. So we've seen that not being a multiple of p, not being a multiple of q are independent of each other, and this will extend to any number, and actually having all of the prime numbers, or infinitely many of them. So we're not going to focus on proving this so much, but what this tells us is that because these are all independent, you have to take my word for that, this is the same as saying that probability x is not a multiple of 2 multiplied by not a multiple of 3 multiplied by not a multiple of 5 and so on. And I'll write this in a slightly more compact way using the capital pi notation. So I'll write this, the product for all prime numbers, P, the probability that x is not a multiple of p. And we know that the probability x is a multiple of p is 1 over p to the power of s. So we know the probability x is not a multiple of p is equal to the product for all prime numbers of 1 minus 1 over p to the power of s. Great. So what we've shown here actually is that the probability of this big complicated event is a product over all prime numbers of this simple little expression here. So let's take a step back now and have a look at this probability of this event. So the probability that x is not a multiple of any number greater than or equal to 2, what does that really mean? Well, we know that x has to be greater than or equal to 1. So x takes all these different values n, but it has to be greater than or equal to 1, and it has to be a positive integer. But if we're not a multiple of any number greater than or equal to 2, if you think about what's left, well, we can't be equal to 2, we can't be equal to 3, we can't be equal to 4, we can't be equal to 5, and so on, and so on. All that's actually left here, we can't be equal to anything greater than or equal to 2. So this just has to be the probability that x equals 1. Okay, and we know what the probability x equals 1 is from the definition here. So this is just 1 over, and then it's 1 to the power of s, zeta of s, which is, of course, just 1 over zeta of s. But then we also know that this probability of not being a multiple of anything greater than or equal to 2 is this product over all prime numbers of 1 minus 1 over p to the power of s. So what, we've, what we can say here, what we've shown is that the product for all prime numbers, 1 minus 1 over p to the s, is equal to 1 over theta of s. And then we can flip both sides, we can take reciprocals here. So zeta of s is equal to, now it's going to be the product, again, for all prime numbers, but now the reciprocal of each term here. So it's going to be 1 over 1 minus 1 over p to the power of s. And this is a really nice result about the Riemann zeta function. And I think this is really amazing that we can see this using tools from probability, using this random variable x here. And then we show that the Riemann zeta function can be expressed as this infinite product.
at least for real values of s.